Here we are. We're all started. Um, yeah, Twain, so what, what chickens do you have at home now? Uh, let's see. At the moment, I have a frizzle rooster. I have some Langshan hens. I have some buff rock hens, some sex link hens, uh, a couple of Dominiques. Um, Langshans. Yeah, I think that's about it. <laughs> My wife just walked by and said, we don't have any sex links. So... <laughs> I don't know. I, I we we always have a variety, and she switches them up every spring. So, yeah. Well, I think. Uh, I mean, it's just like we're going to talk about tonight. A good variation is it's a lot of fun. Um, Absolutely. Just because they all have their their little different pieces to them. They do. They all have different personalities and traits, and so that is you know having all one breed. I mean that's fine, but it is a lot more fun I think if you if you mix them up some. And you're going to find there's ones that you like and and ones that you don't care for. Yep. Well, and that's just figuring out as you go kind of thing, right? Yep. Trial and error. Do you remember what your first chicken was? My first chicken was a just a mixed breed bantam rooster that somebody gave my dad. <laughs> and then and that god i was like seven years old so uh that's where the journey began and i didn't even have him very long in something 80 um yep. and i was heartbroken so we you know we did it right after that we built a better coop and... sorry about the dogs <laughs> it's all right trust me i got one sitting here next to me bothering me so you know it's funny I'll, I'll, every one of my dogs i always vowed i would never have dogs that killed chickens and i have three dogs and every one of them is a certified chicken killer. <laughs> and that's just how that works out and they're mean little dogs i mean they're not i mean they're i love them to death but they're just little guys but they'll definitely kill chickens yeah so well, it's, we just, it's funny how some of them i mean some of them really you know that's what they're drawn to and some just could care less about them yeah, it depends on how, how strong a prey drive they have. Yep. Um, oddly My enough, they have, yeah, Chihuahua mixes. And apparently Chihuahuas have a pretty pretty high chicken killing gene in them. Uh, <laughs> so. You never have a rooster that fights them off? I, Fritz is pretty mellow. He'll try. He's just a little frizzle, frizzle so he's not yeah. super aggressive or mean or anything. Yeah. Do you name all your chickens? My wife does. Okay. <laughs> I can't keep track. I, I don't know Betty from Mabel from, you know, I, I don't know who's who. I know who the rooster is. That's Fred's. Yeah. Um, well, I guess we can kind of start getting into it. Um, okay. Thank you all for joining us. I am Nathan Holloway with The Mill. Uh, we are going to talk about breed selection tonight. We're all everybody's starting to get into their chicken selection and what they're wanting to get. And I know here at the mill, we have, uh, it kind of depends on what store you go to. We kind of have a different set of breeds for every store per week. Uh, you can find all of those online on our website at the So feel free to tune into that. Just that way, when you, if you see a breed in here that you really like, I mean, there's a chance we might be getting it. Um, this is Twain Lockhart with Neutrina Feeds. Um, he's going to be, he's kind of the, our chicken guru, poultry guru that we always rely on if we ever have any questions, whether they're oddball or normal. So, um, we're going to just go through breeds and just kind of talk away with them. Um, if you have questions, please, please put them in the chat, ask away. We are here to help. Um, so rely on us, ask questions along the way. We'll, if we don't get to them during, we'll at least get to them at the end. And if nothing else, we can always follow up. So ask away but other than that twain i'm gonna hand it over to you okay uh we'll get going uh just quick my background uh, i am not a doctor of veterinary medicine i do not have an alphabet behind my name uh but i have been raising chickens since i was about seven years old and i'm old so about 50 years uh, a little over 50 years i've been raising chickens so i do not claim to know it all but i have seen a lot so hopefully you won't make some of the same mistakes I've made. And that's why I'm here is try to get you going on the, on the uh, right step. So do you want to go ahead and go to the next slide? Okay. Um, you know, one of my missions in life, Nathan, is I think everybody should have chickens. 
Uh, I think the world would be a much nicer place if everybody in it had some chickens in their backyard. Everybody would be more relaxed and happier. So it's kind of my personal mission as I go through life to try everybody I can into getting chickens uh, and helping them do it the right way. And I am very, very outspoken about it. Uh, if you're unfortunate enough to be trapped with me someplace, like the uh, waiting room of the dentist's office, we're going to chat. And by the way, I'm like an ex introvert's worst nightmare because uh, I'll just start talking to you. And my opener is so, hey, how you doing? Do you have chickens? Well, there's only a couple of ways you can answer that. Uh, yes. If you say yes, we're going to spend the next 20 minutes talking about your chickens. If you say no, I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes trying to talk you into getting chickens. There's a third answer I don't like, Nathan, and that is, you know, we tried that and didn't work out and we won't do it again. And nine times out of 10, it is because they started with the wrong breed of chicken. So deciding what you want the chickens to do for you and getting the right breed right out of the gate is going to increase the odds of you having a pleasurable experience with this hobby. We'd like to see you stay in the hobby for a good long time. So why don't we go ahead and talk about these breeds? You know, saying that all chickens are all the same is kind of like saying all dogs are all the same and all horses are all the same. It's a ridiculous statement. All the breeds have very different characteristics and some of them may fit your lifestyle and some may not so let's go ahead and uh get started i can't see that on the left it's very small for me um so we're going to talk about beginners chickens intermediates and and a little more advanced the cool thing about this hobby is you can go from rank beginner to intermediate in about a year maybe 18 months and then you can start doing the advanced breeds, I would say, after a couple of years in the hobby. Some people jump right into those in the, in the beginning, and that, that may be a mistake. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So go ahead and go to the next one. These are all very easy, basic chickens. I call them quarter vanilla ice cream chickens. Uh, the Rhode Island Red, you know, we used to say that was America's favorite backyard chicken. I think they've been uh, upstaged possibly by the Buff Orpington. Um, by the way, anybody in the chat want to tell me what's wrong with this slide? There's something wrong with this slide. Uh, very wrong. But anyway, the Rhode Island Red was America's favorite backyard chicken for many, many decades. She is a great beginner's chicken. She's cold hardy. She's uh, heat tolerant. About 250 big brown eggs a year. Uh, she's not broody. Now let's talk about that. Broody is the trait where they want to hatch the eggs. They want to be mom. They've bred that out of most of these production breeds. For most of you, being broody is not a good trait. And I'll tell you why. Um, in the real world, what happens is you come home one day and it's always your favorite chicken. You know, Betty's gone missing. So you figure something ate Betty. You have a funeral service. You move on. Three weeks later, Betty comes out from under the house with a string of baby chicks. Okay, not the end of the world but remember about half of those will be male now here's what really usually happens betty goes missing you assume something made her you have a funeral service you move on you're under the house three months later and there's betty sitting on a pile of rotten eggs well you know she's not laying eggs for you while she's brooding she'll sit there indefinitely if you yank betty off that nest that day it'll probably take you a good six eight weeks to get her back in shape to start laying they get real skinny um, so being broody is not a good trait for most of you. The reason she's sitting on a pile of rotten eggs, by the way, is you don't have a rooster in the zip code, but yet Betty doesn't care. So if she gets that bug and wants to brood and have babies, she's going to do it. Now, Rodon reds are not broody. You'll see this in the catalogs. They'll be broody, moderately broody, or not broody. She's considered not broody. So great beginner's chicken. Uh, you can't hardly go wrong with the Rhode Island red. Next slide. This is another one, another quarter vanilla ice cream chicken. Uh, just like the Rhode Island Red, pretty intelligent, about 250 big brown eggs a year, not broody, cold hardy, heat tolerant, another great choice. Um, you can mix these breeds too. I'll get into some of the exceptions. Uh, kind of broad brush, you don't want to mix your little miniature bantams with full size. People do it and you can get away with it, but a flock of chickens is kind of like middle school. Um, and what happens to the little kids in middle school? They get picked on. And that's what's going to happen to your bantams if they're mixed with your full-size birds. So you can do it, but 
you may have a little bit of drama. Next slide, please. Okay, the Easter egg is another great choice. Not as not quite as big a body as the Rhode Island Red or the uh, Plymouth Rock. Um, maybe not quite as good a layer, but what's unique about these is they lay a colored egg, uh, usually green. Um, now, there's a lot of confusion about the Easter Eggers. I think that's in the next slide. Do we have the slide that has the differences? Yeah. All right. And you'll see these in the hatchery catalogs. And they've been doing this for decades, guys. And I've talked to them about it. And they all kind of say the same thing. Well, we've always done it this way. They kind of lump them all together. An Easter Egger, an Aracana, and an Americana. Three different chickens. Okay, three different breeds. So the Aracana was the root. They come from South America. They're a small rumpless bird, meaning they don't have a tail. Uh, they lay very, very dark colored eggs. Then somebody decided, but you know, the problem with the Aracana is they didn't lay very big eggs. They're a little bit flighty as far as the chicken goes. If you don't go to chicken shows, you've probably never seen an Aracana. Um, in the 80s, they recognized the Americana, the 1980s. Uh, it is an Aracana, and they crossed it with a bigger bodied bird. They do breed true, meaning if you cross two Americanas, you get another one out. They only lay blue eggs. Aracanas do breed true. Easter eggers are sort of, think of an Americana without a pedigree. Every hatchery kind of has a little bit different version of what's going on. They generally lay green eggs. They may or may not all look the same. They do not breed true, okay? If you cross two Easter eggers, you're going to get a chicken, but it's going to be, it won't be the same as the parents. It's because it's going to be kind of a crossbreed. So nothing wrong with Easter eggers. If you're getting chicks from a hatchery, I don't care what they label them as. More than likely, they're an Easter egger. They're great chickens. Where this comes into play is if your kids ever wanted to take them to a poultry show and show them as an Americana, they'll get disqualified. So that's all there is to it. But this is another great beginner's breed. Um, not quite as good a layer as the first two, but cold hardy, intelligent. I mean, everything's right. They're just a lot of confusion with, uh, with those three breeds. So next slide, please. Okay, I kind of covered that. The Aracana is the root breed. Next slide. Then the Americanas, they recognize those in the 80s. Next slide. And then the Easter egg, which is what the hatcheries generally have. And again, there's nothing wrong with any of these. But if you're getting from a hatchery or a farm, or a farm store, this is probably what you're getting. Next slide. Okay. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is probably... Uh, now America's favorite backyard chicken, it doesn't really matter. I mean, they're a great choice. Um, I call them the golden retrievers of the chicken world. Super, super friendly, almost to a fault. I mean, they're not super predator safe. Uh, they'll wander out into the yard and maybe say hi to a coyote or a wolf or something, and that doesn't end well for them. Uh, but other than that, they're super, super sweet birds. They lay about 200 big brown eggs a year. They can be a little bit broody, but not too bad. But these are a great beginner's chickens. Um, people love these. And they come in many colors. But the one in the picture is a buff. Uh, it's a British breed. Uh, just a great beginner's chicken. They're kind of a big bird, too. They're a little bigger than the other ones. Next slide. The Australorps, an Australian chicken. Big black bird. Um, you may run across a lot of, you know, tidbits of trivia on the Internet about chickens when you get into this hobby. This one, she is known for laying the most eggs in a contest, how uh, laying the most consecutive days in a row. The reason I'm telling you that is this is kind of um, deceptive, and it's not meant to be. They, it just happened to work out this way in this contest they did. She's a good layer, but she is by no means the best layer. In that contest, she just happened to win it, and it was pretty well publicized. Uh, big brown eggs, about 225 a year. Good, uh, cold hardy, heat tolerant. They're cold hardy and they're from Australia, which is kind of interesting. They can be a little bit broody, but not too bad. Next slide. Wyandots, uh, these are very, very pretty. That is a silver laced. They come in multiple colors. Most of them that are coming from the hatchery are either silver laced or gold laced. Uh, silver laced being the most common. Very colorful, very beautiful birds. All the right traits. 
about 200 big brown eggs a year. Um, you know, if you want to just add some color to the flock, these are these are a great choice, but they have a good temperament. Uh, not a bad choice for a beginner. Next slide. Sex links. Okay, you'll hear this. So what is it? A sex link is basically a hybrid. They call them a sex link because the hatcheries can tell at a glance when they hatch if they're male or female by their coloring. Where does this come into play? Well, everybody else at the hatchery, they sex them. They call it vent sexing is the main way they do that. And they have to pay somebody to do this. They uh, go through six months of uh, training, and then they do a two-year apprenticeship to learn how to do this. So, no, I have no idea how they do it. There's 32 different combinations. They look at the vent when they're a baby chick, and they can tell by the shape. Uh, they run about 95% accurate, which is pretty good. That's pretty impressive. But, you know, in a box of 100 chicks, five of you won't be too happy. Sex links, you're approaching that 100% mark. I'm not going to say anything's 100%, but you're pretty close, okay? They don't miss too often with the uh, hybridization. So if having a rooster is absolutely out of the question, you may want to consider sex links. They come and there's a lot of different kinds. There's gold comets and red stars and isa browns and black sex links, but they will always be labeled as a sex link. So the odds you get in rooster are slim and none. They uh, about you're you're getting close to about 300 big brown a are really good producers, uh, very intelligent. You know how you get that uh, rescue dog from the pound that's a hind 57 and. The dog just seems to be super smart. Well, it's because it's hybrid. When you inbreed chickens, a lot of things happen and none of them are good. Uh, one of the things that goes is the brain, sometimes the disposition, sometimes the immune system. So you might end up with a stupid mean chicken that gets sick a lot. Not a great combo. Sex links are hybrid. So you have two different gene pools, great immune systems, real smart, um, uh, intelligent, now, you may read somewhere that they don't live as long in large numbers. If you took, a, uh, let's say you took a study of like a thousand sex links and a thousand Rhode Island Reds, you would probably find the Rhode Island Reds have a slightly longer lifespan because the sex links are a little more prone to uh, ovarian issues like ovarian cancer. And yes, chickens do get that. So that can happen. I'll be honest with you. I've been raising chickens a long time. I've really never noticed that the sex links don't live as long. So great beginner's breed. I'm a big fan of sex links. A lot of the shows won't let you show them because they're a crossbreed, but some of the shows are allowing the kids to show them as a, just as a laying breed and they allow them in. So things are changing. So next slide, please. Gold Comet. There's a real common sex link. Um, Cinnamon Queens, another one. Next slide. Uh, there's a lot of different sex links, um, there, but they'll always be labeled as. So these are kind of intermediate, um, like your Buckeye. Uh, anybody know what's what's uh, unique about the Buckeye chicken? Somebody always says, oh, they're from Ohio. Okay, yeah, that's kind of in the name. They were the only breed developed by a woman, so that's pretty cool. Uh, these are a good beginner's chicken. They're just not quite as common. That's why we list them in the intermediates. They're not, you know, in your everyday farm store, but they're cold hardy. They are smart. They're uh, about 250 big brown eggs a year. My wife had some of these a couple of years ago and she really liked them. So uh, another great beginner's choice. Next slide. The Sussex. Um, Another good one, uh, not quite as common. That's why it's listed as an intermediate. Uh, big brown eggs, about 200 a year. Really beautiful birds. They also add a lot of color to the flock. All the right traits. Uh, not broody, cold hardy, smart. Uh, just a great choice. By the way, when I say it's a good beginner's choice, by no means does that not mean that you, if you're more advanced that you can't get these. What you may find is when you get into this hobby, the first couple of years, you start with what I call the quarter vanilla ice creams. And then a couple of years into it, you get kind of adventurous and you get some of the fancy ones. And then a couple of years later, guess what? You're back to the quarter vanilla ice creams. There's a reason why they're so popular because they're just great chickens. So all of these so far are great choices. Next slide, please. 
The Morans, okay, we're getting a little fancy here. The Morans are a French breed. Um, what they're known for is they lay a very, very dark card shell uh, egg. I mean, it's almost like chocolate. It's very cool, um, you know, to get one or two to put them in your flock just so that you have, you know, some variety in your, your eggs. Maybe you're selling them to the neighbors or giving them to the neighbors. The downside to them is they're not as good a producer. Um, they're getting better as the genetics are getting better with these. Um, you're probably talking uh, more like 100 eggs a year. I mean, they're not a bad bird. They're smart. They're uh, good foragers or not too broody. A little bit, not too bad. Uh, just not going to be as good a producer as some of the other ones we've talked about. So next slide, please. So we've talked about the breeds and the colors. Uh, it's becoming kind of a big deal. I know some of the 4-H kids, they actually show the eggs themselves. So it's becoming kind of a big deal. Next slide. Okay, so mini chickens. These are your bantams. Think of the ponies of the chicken world. Um, they're miniatures. So, remember I said mixing these with your full-size birds may not be a good choice. I'm not going to say you can't do it, but you just may have some drama. They may pick on the little guys. And these guys are about a third the size of your full-size. So, they're pretty little. They're extremely broody as a rule. Most bantams want to hatch every egg that they lay. I mean, they're like all about like reproducing. Um, they may not be as cold hardy. They don't have the body mass that the big birds do. Now, some of them have a lot of under feathering and they can do okay. It's like your cochins, things like that. But some of the little tight feathered birds, not so much. Like your old English games, modern games, things like that. They may not do so well in a uh, Midwest or a Northeast winter. So, next slide, please. By the way, the eggs are also about a third the size of the full-size eggs. So, I mean, don't put unfair expectations on these little guys. They're neat little birds. They lay little eggs. They don't lay, they're not really bred for production, so they don't lay a lot of eggs per year. And they want to hatch everything they lay. So, next slide. The silky, uh, let's go back to the dentist's office. Remember when I was talking about people start with the wrong breeds of chicken? This is not a bad or wrong breed. It's just maybe not a good beginner's chicken. Um, they've been around forever. Uh, this is one of the oldest breeds. In fact, it's probably the oldest breed we've talked about so far. Uh, they go back to, well, let's put it this way. Marco Polo wrote about them in like the 1200. So, I mean, it, they've been around a long, long time. They came from China. Uh, they are really a unique bird. They're a flightless bird. They have a different kind of feathering. Um, very broody. Okay, I, I don't want to upset anybody, but they have been a little bit inbred. And remember, when you inbreed chickens, one of the things to go is the brain. So, silkies may not be the brightest bulb in the chandelier. Uh, there's nothing wrong with them. They're little. They're cute. If you want to raise silkies, by all means, raise, raise silkies. Getting one or two to mix with your flock of your big birds, they're probably going to get picked on, guys. I'm just telling you. So just keep that in mind, and they're going to try and hatch every egg that they lay. So next slide, please. The sizzle is a frizzle and a silky cross. Uh, this is another one that maybe wait till you're a little more advanced, and you're going to raise bantams and keep them segregated from the big birds. Uh, she's not going to be a great producer, very broody. They're cute. They're really neat looking, but they're just not super functional. Next slide. The frizzle uh, is a normally a cochin, and the frizzle gene is uh, it's actually a genetic mutation where the feathers come in upside down. Uh, nothing wrong with these. Uh, my seminar rooster, when I travel and do live events, is a frizzle. He was a rescue, and he's a real sweet little bird. Just don't put unfair, unfair expectations on these little guys because generally they don't lay a lot of eggs. They're super broody. Um, you know, they don't do well in real wet weather because their feathers are upside down. You know, they get rained on and they kind of look like a drowned rat. Uh, but otherwise, I mean, you know, I'm in Wisconsin and Fritz does okay. So um, just don't put unfair expectations on them. Next slide. The showgirl, that's a silky and a uh, naked neck. Um, 
we've had silkies and naked necks at the same time. And my wife absolutely forbid me to allow them to reproduce. Uh, uh, they're really neat looking birds. Not They're actually a little more functional than the other ones because the naked neck's a pretty functional bird. Uh, but they're just weird looking. I mean, uh, they're unique, but just kind of weird. Next slide, please. The Polish. Okay, here's one that the real common couple of years into the hobby, you decide to get one of these and put it in your flock because they're so cool looking. I almost promise you they're going to pick on this bird. They're not dumb birds. Don't let somebody tell you they're a stupid bird. They're not. But that headdress that they have, they can't see. It really affects their vision, so they're going to get picked on. The other thing, chickens are flock animals, and it's all about flock survival. So having something that's very attention-getting like that, crest they don't like that so they're going to do one of two things they'll probably either vote her off the island do her in uh or they'll try to remove that crest they'll just yank it out and they're none too gentle about that so neither one is a good option so if you're going to raise polish raise polish if not i don't recommend getting one to mix with the flock everybody i've ever told it to they always do it anyway and then they call me and tell me what's going on they're oh my god i should listen to you been there, done that, because I did that too, guys. So all the mistakes that I mentioned, I've probably done, sometimes twice. So sometimes three times. Next slide. So next slide. All right. So the leghorn, there's nothing wrong with this bird. But they tend to be very flighty. Um, some people say crazy. I'm sure there's somebody out there that says, oh, no, my, my leghorns are just wonderful. Okay. But that's not the norm. Uh, if you Googled what chicken lays the most eggs, almost promise you it's going to be the leghorn. The white leghorn is going to pop up. They are egg-laying machines. Scrawny white chicken that lays a big white egg. They're super efficient. That's why they use them commercially. That does not mean they're going to be a good backyard chicken. If you only want the eggs, they're great. If you want them to be like a ranch chicken to pick up insects and stuff, and you don't care about them being friendly, you know, if you don't care if they're pets, fine. But if you want them to be, most people want to have chickens that are kind of kind of a combination. They're backyard chickens that are pets that make you breakfast type of thing. Leghorn's probably not a great choice for that. Um, but other than that, I mean, they're not a bad chicken. There's no such thing as bad chickens. Uh, this is another one that gets beginners out of the hobby. You know, they're expecting their chickens to be nice and friendly and they think they did something wrong. Well, you kind of did. You picked the wrong breed. A leghorn's not going to be a good pet chicken, typically. There's exceptions. Next slide, please. Nathan, did you want to handle? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we did have a couple good questions come in, and feel okay. free to ask more um, along the way. The first one was, uh, so we, we do have some people that haven't had chickens before. So, okay. Um, and you got to remember, so we're getting from Mount Healthy. And so would you recommend medicated or non-medicated feed? Is there a oh. better best or what do you recommend? Okay. Next? The medicated feed, that's a great question because a lot of times you don't even know what it is. The medicated feed is there for one thing and one thing only. It is to help prevent coccidiosis. Now you're probably thinking, okay, great. What's coccidiosis? Coccidiosis is actually a parasite. It's a protozoa and it is spread from bird to bird. We used to say it was spread by wild birds, and actually it is, but it's a different strain that affects poultry. But it gets into your flock, then it gets into the ground, and then it stays there for a long time. I mean, like years. So if you've ever had coccidiosis on your property, you should probably feed medicated feed from then on, okay? It's basically a personal choice, Nathan. It's not a right or wrong, but if, if you've ever had it on your property, okay, you're stuck. You need to do medicated feed. Um, the symptoms of coccidiosis, uh, they start pooping blood. It, it's pretty striking, uh, pretty dramatic. Don't panic. Uh, at that point, you, you can actually still get coccidiosis even if you're feeding medicated feed, if the bedding gets a big enough saturation of coccidiosis. Uh, they're like little eggs. They call them ukis. I don't even know if that's how you pronounce it. That's how it reads, though. Uh, and if you have a high enough concentration, even with a medicated feed, you can get coccidiosis going. So once they show symptoms, 
it's too late for the medicated feed. At that point, I can't tell you how to solve it because I'm not a doctor of veterinary medicine. But if you do a simple internet search, how to treat coccidiosis in chickens, it'll pop right up. Nathan, you probably have it right there at the mill. It may be in a different aisle, different species aisle. That's why it gets kind of weird. I can't say what it is, but it, it's not expensive. And it's actually the same drug that is in the medicated chick feed. So is it a right or wrong answer? No, it is personal choice. Uh, but if you've ever had it on your property, you should feed it from here on in. Keeping your bedding clean and dry is about nine tenths of the battle. And, uh, so there's that. In 50 years of raising chickens, I've had it four times. Um, believe it or not, they were all with the uh, Cornish cross meat chickens every single time. So not that the, I, I don't know if there's anything to that or not. Just, you know, an observation. So, yeah. Other- and, well, from what I've from what I talk to people, right, it's it's a, such a cheap insurance policy to me. That's like, there's no reason not to do it. Um, obviously, controlling what you can, right? We can control bedding, keep it as clean and dry as we can. And we can control putting medicated feed in front of them or not with, I mean, it might be 10, 20 cents extra per bag. And it's just like, there's no reason not to, in my opinion. And, and by the way, it's not a antibiotic. Some people don't like feeding yeah. an antibiotic. It's not an antibiotic. There's no withdrawal time. Uh, you can eat the eggs or, or the chicken itself after eating this feed the same day. So no withdrawal time. You know, it just depends. It's personal choice. My wife is not yeah. a fan of feeding a medication as a preventative, so she doesn't. If she sees an outbreak, she treats them. But otherwise, no. Yeah. But it, it, it's personal choice. Yep. And especially for those, those little ones, right? And just doing what you can to take care of them. But yep. um, another good question, um, and this is probably something that we could have hit on throughout the whole thing. What is the average lifespan of a hen? That's a tough one. Um, I'm going to say a good, safe pad answer is about five. Um, she's going to lay the best for the first two years, and then they taper down off of that. Usually about the time they hit five or So you run out of eggs. They have a finite number of eggs. They go through what I call henopause. Uh, it's not a real word. We kind of made it up. And then you may have a chicken that runs around for another five or six years and never lays another egg. They can go much, much longer. Pretty average. Um, remember, Nathan, they are pre- uh, prey animals. So, you know, at 40, Betty's kind of agile and she dodges that, that coyote at five. She's half a step slower, doesn't quite dodge the coyote. You've got that going on just like with other animals. As they get older, their immune system uh, is not as good. So you have that going on as well. So, Yep. Thanks, Twain. Um, so I guess we can honestly make this a two-parter. Well, no, let's keep it a one. Uh, what's the best way to ing- integrate new chickens to older chickens? So we have a lot of people getting new chickens now. Okay. Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit in the next presentation, but we can also talk about it here. So how do you how do you handle that? How old? What are you looking for? Okay. Common mistake, and please, please, please <clears throat> don't do this, guys uh, and ladies. People will have chickens they've had a year in their second year with chickens. They will go and they'll buy a bunch of baby chicks and they'll bring them home and they'll put them out in the coop. Well, somebody in there is going to take care of those chickens. Uh, Yeah, somebody's going to take care of them. And if you have little kids, you can't unring this bell or they can't unsee what's going to happen. If those chicks don't belong to one of those chickens, they don't just kill them, guys. They're on the menu. Okay. And, and I mean, it's pretty disturbing. Um, so don't do that. But you can, and people do it all the time, add new chickens to your flock. But you want to wait until they're about five to six weeks old. Wait till they're fully feathered. And even then, I mean, you could put them in the coop with the guys, with the girls. Uh, you're going to have a lot of drama. And in that drama, people may get hurt or chickens may get hurt. So what we always do is we one of two choices. You can either divide the coop in two with wire from top to bottom. Eh, not not so easy for most people. What's easier for most people is you have a wire cage or like a dog crate. Put the young birds in that. Put them in the coop. Feed them and water them in that cage for about two weeks. Let the big girls get used to them. Uh, they can't get to them though. Then one night, 
chickens are blind at night. They can't see. I mean, like literally they can't see anything. So one evening, late evening, take the young chickens, put them up on the perch next to the old ones. Let them all wake up together. No, they're not going to wake up one big happy family, but you've reduced the drama quite a bit. Another trick I have found that works pretty well is put some scratch down, put it on the ground. So when they all wake up that first morning, there's some food on the ground. It's a treat. They get distracted by that. Now, don't do that all the time. You don't want to leave food out overnight all the time because you will get rodents. But one night's not going to hurt anything. You're going to be feeding those babies the chick starter for the first 16 weeks. And then the adults are going to be on adult food. So there may be some crossover. If you're feeding the adults pellets, the babies probably won't bother that. It won't hurt either one of them to eat the other one's food. You may see the adults eating the baby food more as a dominance thing. And as long as you have oyster shell out there for a calcium supplement, there's no problem. Uh, there's virtually no calcium in the baby food. And they need that calcium for the nice hard egg shells. So you're going to have that going on. Make sure you add water stations. Sometimes the big girls can be kind of mean and uh, they may not let the little ones drink. So if you add a couple of water stations, they can't they can't do that. You should have multiple water stations anyway, uh, especially coming into warm weather uh, so that everybody can get water all the time. Perfect. Thanks, Twain. Um, next one. I have ducks and chickens together. How do I keep my chicken, chickens from pecking at the ducks? Clutch. Ah, at the duck's clutch. So they're eating the duck's eggs? Yeah, um, so. Okay, I've got to preface this with you're really not supposed to keep waterfowl with anything else. Uh, you're not supposed to mix species. People do it all the time. I just had to say that. Okay, from biosecurity standpoint, um, I would... say those breeds of ducks they like to breed in the water so they can actually drown your hens they they'll grab them drag them in the water and, and drown them they may not mean to drown them but it, you know the end result's the same so i'm i'm actually really concerned about that the chickens eating the or pecking at the, the clutch of eggs um uh, Kind of sounds like maybe there's a, maybe you have a calcium deficiency. Do you have oyster shell available for them? That would be my first instinct. Um, but yeah, you probably should try and segregate them if you can. Perfect. Thanks, Twain. Do you okay. have any preference on sand or wood chips in the run? Oh boy, sand in the in the coop in the coop in the run that you could start a fight on Facebook in any of those chicken groups about the sand, whether it's good or bad, and and it's like it's real polarizing. We don't do sand at our house. We do shavings. I just family. Uh, there's some people that swear by sand. Um, and if you're going to do sand, make sure it's natural. You don't want that synthetic sand. That's that's kind of my only opinion about that. Yep. Um, and then I think our final question here, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, I think I'm overfeeding my chickens. How much feed is enough? It seems that they're always hungry. Um, the chickens self-regulate their diet very, very well. Okay. Uh, you should be going through, if these are standard laying hens, the good rule of thumb is about five pounds of feed per chicken per month. So 10 chickens, 50 pound bag. If you're doing a lot more than that, you may be feeding something else. You may be feeding a bunch of rodents. You may be feeding wild birds. You know, so neither one of those are your friends if you have chickens. So that is the good rule of thumb. Uh, if the chickens are hungry all the time, sometimes that can be, uh, depends on what you're feeding. You're, because they self-regulate. So let me, let's use an example. If you're feeding scratch as 100% of the diet, they're going to gobble that up like it's candy. Okay. I'm sure it does taste good, but they're eating it like it's going out of style because they're trying to... Uh, achieve their nutritional needs and there just isn't that much going on in scratch it's like nine percent protein there's no vitamin pack so they're just going to have to eat a lot of that to maintain their nutritional needs so they're going to eat it like it's going out of style so i, I don't want to get into a you know good feed bad feed that kind of thing scratch is a good example 
but some of your, your layer feeds may not have as good a vitamin pack. Um, it may not have as high energy level. So they're going to eat more of that than they would a higher tech feed. So there's that going on too. Awesome. That answered the question. No, I think you did. Uh, okay. And that's, I mean, a lot of chickens, as long as you're offering the feed, they will self-regulate. Um, but I think we're going to wrap up, uh, be looking for our next. So next okay. Thursday at six o'clock, we are having a, uh, I'll let you go again here a second, but uh, okay. next Thursday, we are going to have our, our second follow-up to this. It's going to be my second year with chickens and Twain will be back on. Um, you needed something to say, Twain? I wanted to touch on biosecurity just a little bit. Oh, um, yeah, good idea. You know, the bird flu is out there again this year, guys. Uh, it's not in the news very much because what's going on in Europe. So it's kind of taken like second or third place in the news. Uh, we dealt with this in 2016. Um, it's not something to panic over and not a reason not to get chickens. But a couple of things that you can do to protect yourself. Uh, there's a method, what we call coop shoes. If you have a pair of shoes or maybe you bought Oh, don't go out and mix with wild waterfowl because that's who's spreading it, ducks and geese. Well, it's not like I go out and frolic with ducks in the park. Something I didn't think of. If you're going out and you play golf, you know, you're walking through the golf course and the geese and the ducks are out there. If you step in that, the feces and you bring that back to your... ...way that it's is on in the feces you now you go fishing you go to the pond by at the park and you walk around that and you enter you know now you are kind of mingling with the waterfowl even if you don't see them you might walk through their coop so having a pair of shoes that you know only go in the coop and you're also not tracking your problems out this is just good biosecurity whether it be um avian flu or something else you're, you're not bringing your problems out you're not bringing anything in so uh you may read about it. It does not transfer to humans. Uh, there's not been any cases of that in this strain whatsoever. Uh, it's just highly contagious to other poultry. So that's that's my little boring commentary on <laughs> bird flu. Uh, you know, don't panic. Well, I think it's something worth. It's we're definitely worth noting. Again, we don't want to panic, but we just want to be smart with what we're doing. Absolutely, protect your birds. So, just have a pair of yep. coop shoes. Yep, just have a pair of coop shoes, and those are the only ones that go in there. Yep. Um, but again, thank you, Twain. He is our resident poultry guru that we like to rely on, and we continue. We will continue to do that. Um, but look for us next Thursday at six o'clock again on Facebook, Facebook Live, and uh, we'll be talking about my second year with chickens. Um, but again, go to themillstores.com, and we'll have all of the list of different breeds we're having and when we're bringing them in. Now uh, that's not a guarantee, just because of them getting here, but we will do our best to communicate when they're getting here and we'll take care of them and help you guys out along the way. So thank you again. And uh, we will go from there. Thanks, Twain. Thank you. Thanks for uh, joining us, everyone. Really appreciate your attention. And yep. have fun See with your